Hello, maths fans. The one silver lining of the current COVID-19 pandemic is that I now have much more free time to concentrate on making videos. So I thought I'd start by explaining some of the mathematical models that we use to model the spread of infectious diseases. The first one being the SIR model. In the SIR model, the total population is divided up into three categories or three components. So first we have S, which is equal to susceptibles. So these will be people who could potentially catch the disease. Then we have I, these are called the infectives. So this will be people who currently have the disease and can infect others. And then R stands for removed, and this is the group of people who have already caught the disease and have now either recovered from the disease or have died. With all mathematical models, we have to make various assumptions to simplify the real world phenomena because things are just too complicated to express everything in a set of simple equations. So here, the first assumption that we make is that the epidemic is sufficiently short, so it doesn't last that long, so that we can assume that the total population remains constant. The second assumption in our model relates to the way in which the disease is transmitted. And we assume that the rate of increase in the infectives is proportional to the contact between susceptibles and infectives. And we assume that this occurs at a constant rate. Now our third assumption relates to the removal rate in this category R. So we're going to assume again that there is a constant rate. This could be a death rate or a recovery rate. But again, we're going to assume that that is constant. Now that we've made our assumptions, we can start to write down the equations that are going to govern our model. So remember, we're interested in S, I, and R, the number of susceptibles, infectives, and the removed population. So if we start with the susceptibles, so the rate of change over time of the number of susceptibles, then based on our assumptions, we expect from number two that it's going to decrease as people become infective. And so the rate of change of the number of susceptibles is going to be equal to minus, because it's decreasing, the rate of contact, R, which is our assumption in number two, and we said that it was proportional to the number of infectives and the number of susceptibles. So these two letters being here together is symbolizing a contact between the number of infectives and the number of susceptibles, and the R here is this rate of contact or transmission between them. Now for the infectives, we have a similar equation. So we want to know the rate of change of I over time, and this now will grow according to people moving from susceptible into infective. So now we have R, I, S. So the same term as what we had for the first equation for the rate of change of susceptibles, but now it's a plus because susceptibles are moving to become infective. And now we also have by assumption three that infectives recover or die at a constant rate. So if you are an infective, then you then move into the third category, the R or the removed category. So here we have minus this constant rate, which I'm going to label A, times the number of infectives. And that just leaves the final equation, which is to say that the rate of change of those removed in the population must be equal to the gain from here. So as people are lost from the infective category, they move into the removed category here at the same rate. We now have three differential equations for our three categories of people within the population. So S for susceptibles, the number of susceptibles is going to decrease according to the number of contacts between infectives and susceptibles. I is the number of infectives, and this will increase due to contact between people and decrease from people either recovering or dying as a result of the disease. And finally, the removed category, people that no longer can catch the disease, either because they've recovered or have died, this is going to increase at this constant rate depending on how many infectives there are. So we have differential equations. If you're familiar with these, you'll know you need some initial data before you can solve 
the system of equations. And so the way we do this is we define the initial number of susceptible people in the population. So we say that is going to equal S0. We then say the initial number of infectives will also be specified. Let's call that I0. And at the very start of the outbreak, we don't expect there to be anybody in this removed section because nobody has yet recovered or died from the disease. So the initial value of R will be zero. Now we've yet to talk about assumption one in the context of our model and the context of our equations. So if we go back to this, it says that the population must remain constant during the epidemic. So what that actually means is that the rate of change of susceptibles plus infectives plus removed all added together must be zero because the total population is given by S plus I plus R. We can actually go one step further with this first assumption and we can solve this equation because we know the initial conditions for the population. So if the total population doesn't change with respect to time, then that says it's the same constant value for all possible values of time. And so we just take the initial value to be a starting point, which is the value of the population at the beginning. But then as time progresses, it can't change because it has a constant value. So it's always equal to that initial value. Now that we've formed our differential equations that together make up the SIR model, we can start to ask some interesting questions. So the first question might be, will the disease spread? So we have an initial number of infected people given by I0 at the beginning of the epidemic. And what we want to know is, will that grow? Because if the number of infectives starts to grow, then you have a spread of a disease through a population. So what we're interested in is going to be the rate of change of the number of infectives. But before we do that, we actually want to start on the ds by dt question. Because this tells us that the rate of change of the number of susceptibles is equal to a negative value. Because R is some positive constant, it's a transmission rate. I is a number in a population, as is S. So all of these three things are positive. And so the change of S, the rate of change of S, is always negative. So this tells us that S must always be smaller than its initial value. And this, of course, makes complete sense, I think, in the context of a disease. Because at the very beginning of the outbreak, everyone in the population, in theory, is susceptible to the disease, especially with something new like COVID-19 that's never been seen before. So if S is always going to decrease because its rate of change is negative, then this tells us that S must be less than or equal to its initial value, S0. We can take this value this S0 and plug it in to our di by dt equation. So we have an inequality now in our rate of change for the number of infectives. And we said an epidemic will occur if the size of i increases from the initial value of i0. So to answer our first question, will the disease spread? It just comes down to the sign of this particular constant here. So if this constant is positive, then there will be a spread of the disease. So what that means is that if S0 is greater than A divided by R, then the disease will indeed spread. This ratio here, A divided by R, is actually a little easier to think about if you flip it and consider what we call Q, where Q is equal to R divided by A and is called the contact ratio. This is the fraction of the population that comes into contact with an infective individual during the period when they are infectious. We can also rearrange this inequality to get a slightly different version of the same condition for whether or not an epidemic will occur. So if we multiply up by R and then divide by A, we create a new parameter, R S naught divided by A, and this is called the basic reproductive number or the basic reproductive ratio. And this condition here tells us that we will have an epidemic if this is greater than one. This number R naught or the basic reproductive ratio or basic reproductive number 
is something that you may have heard about in the context of COVID-19. Because this number represents the number of secondary infections in the population caused by one initial primary infection. So in other words, if one person has the particular disease, then the R0 value will tell you how many infections on average that person will cause. So how many other people they will give the disease to within the population. For seasonal flu, the value of R0 is somewhere between 1.5 and 2, whereas for COVID-19, it's estimated to be more like 3 to 4. So the exact numbers are obviously still being determined because this is a very much an ongoing outbreak that we've never seen before. But the number is certainly much higher than the 1.5 or 2 that you see for seasonal flu. And this is telling us that for every one person infected with the disease, they are passing it on to three or four other people, which is why it is spreading so rapidly all around the world. Another question that we might be interested in knowing the answer to is what will be the maximum number of infectives at any given time? because knowing the number of infected people is very helpful when it comes to planning how to distribute health resources. So we want to create an equation for I that's in terms of various parameters that we know within our system of equations. And what we do this time, in fact, is combine the ds by dt equation with the di by dt equation. So we take these two together, because if I do di by dt divided by the s by dt, I end up with an equation di by ds. So if we simplify this a little bit, these two terms are going to cancel perfectly because they're exactly the same. So we get a minus 1. And then the second term here, the i, will cancel in both terms. So we get plus a over r and then with an s on the bottom. Thinking back to our answer to question 1 about the spread of the disease, we introduce this parameter q, which was equal to r divided by a. So if we rephrase that final term in terms of q, we have minus 1 plus 1 divided by q times s. And this equation, di by ds equal to minus 1 plus 1 over qs, is something that we can now integrate directly and actually solve. Now we also of course have initial conditions and that's what's going to form the right hand side of my equation. So our final equation is given in the blue box at the bottom and it's just in terms of I, S, this contact ratio Q which is fixed by the model and the initial conditions I0 and S0. Whilst we have this equation for I in terms of S and the parameters of our model, we haven't yet found I max, the maximum number of infectives at any given time, which is what we want to answer our second question. Now, when normally thinking about maximums and minimums of functions, you would differentiate the function. But fortunately, we already have the derivative from combining these first two equations. And so we can see that this is zero when S is equal to one over Q. Because if S is one over Q, you have minus one plus one equals naught. And so the maximum value of i, i max, will actually occur in this equation when s is equal to 1 over q. Substituting this value into our equation and rearranging for i, we get the value of i max. So this here is our final expression for i max. And by writing it like this, we can actually see a bit more what is going on. So this says that the maximum number of infectives, so the answer to the question that we are interested in, what's the maximum number of people that will have the disease at a given time? The maximum number of infectives is equal to the total population. So to begin with, it's sort of everybody. But then we take away something here, which it turns out is positive. Now, the positive number depends a lot on this parameter Q, this contact ratio, because S0 for a disease like COVID-19, for example, is everybody, because this is the first appearance of this disease, and so the whole population is in fact susceptible to the disease initially. So S0 is sort of some very large fixed number, but the interesting thing here is what happens as Q varies. If we consider this as a function, let's call it f of x to make it easier to plot, then what we're interested in is what f of x 
looks like. And then we just remember that we're subtracting off f of x. So we want to plot 1 over x times 1 plus log of x times some constant value s0. And what this is going to look like is as follows. So f of x and x, we've got 1 over x, 1 plus log. So we have this increase, very, very sharp increase initially, and then the function starts to do something like this. And this peak up here is around s0. Now what does this mean in practice? So the key parameter here is the value q, which I plotted as x on our graph. And this, remember, is the contact ratio. This is the fraction of the population that comes into contact with an infected individual. So in the current outbreak of COVID-19, this value of Q is actually really high because the disease is very easy to transmit. Lots of people are getting it and lots of people are coming into contact with those that have it, especially due to this long incubation period where the symptoms might not show. So ultimately for our model, it means Q is very, very big for the COVID-19 outbreak. And so looking at our graph, if Q is big, or X on our graph, then F of X is actually very small. So we're down here at the far end of the graph. And so the value of F is actually quite small. And so what this means for our maximum number of infectives is that the maximum number of people that can have the disease at any given time is equal to the total population minus this function, where our function, in fact, is now quite small. So this is very, very bad news for an outbreak that has a large Q value like COVID-19, because this says that the maximum number of people that can catch the disease at one point in time is actually most of the population. The third and final question that we might want to ask about our disease spread is how many people in total will end up catching the disease. And to answer this question, we actually need to go back to assumption one and this idea of the total population being constant. We first need to think about what does it mean for the disease to end? Because if we want to know the total number of people that caught the disease, we need the actual spread of the disease to have ended in the first place. This means that the number of infectives must go down to zero. So if we call this point in the future just the end of the outbreak, then what we can do is look at our total population equation and actually rearrange to find the size of R, the removed component at the very end of the outbreak. Because the number of people who have either caught the disease or died from the disease, i.e. all the people in the removed or R component of the model, will actually then give you the total number of people that have caught the disease. So what we can do is now rewrite this equation in the yellow box for what it must look like at the end of the epidemic. So everything here is known except S end. So we have the total population, I naught plus S naught, minus the number of susceptible people left at the end of the epidemic. To find the value of S end, what we do is in fact go back to our equation from question two, the one in this blue box that came from integrating di by ds, and now we let time progress to the end of the epidemic. So we solve this equation to get the number of susceptibles left at the end of the epidemic, s end, and then we substitute that value into this equation to get the number of removed people or the size of the removed population at the end of the epidemic. And this is exactly the answer to how many people caught the disease during the outbreak. Like we did before, to get a feel for what's going on here, we're going to consider the graph of this function. So if I plot S end as the Y value up here, and then on the X axis, I'm going to put Q, our contact ratio, because as we saw, in question two for the maximum number of infectives, that was really key in controlling the behavior of the disease outbreak. So here we have Q. So what I'm plotting really is I have Y minus one over X times log of Y is equal to a load of constant values minus one over X times again, some other constant. So this approximately looks something like as follows. It comes through here 
and then kind of goes flat. Thinking again about the context of the current COVID-19 outbreak, we said in question two that the value of Q here, this contact ratio is very, very high. And so for a large value of Q, this is going to have a very, very small value over here. So SN is actually going to be quite small. And that is bad news once again, in terms of answering our question, because our end, the total number of people who catch the disease, remember, is equal to the total population, I naught plus S naught, and then subtracting off this S end value. But for a large value of Q, S end is small, and so we're not really subtracting off much from the total population. So in summary, quite a lot, if not the vast majority of the population will actually catch the disease if the value of Q is sufficiently large. And so what does this all mean for COVID-19? I've said throughout this video that this contact ratio Q is really key to determining this behavior. And we can see it very clearly in these three answers to our important questions about this spread of disease. So what we're seeing here is that if Q is large, then first of all, the disease will spread. An epidemic will occur. Of course, it's a bit too late to say this now. There already is a pandemic happening all over the world. Question two, it tells us that the maximum number of infectives, so the maximum number of people who have the disease at a given time, is equal to everybody minus this function of Q. And we saw that the function of Q was actually small for a large value of Q. So in the case of COVID-19, the maximum number of infectives at any given time is almost equal to the whole population. And then for question three, we asked how many people will catch the disease? Again, for COVID-19, Q is large, this contact ratio. And so this tells us that basically, again, most of the population or the vast majority will catch the disease for a large value of Q. Now, of course, we kind of knew all of this. There is an epidemic and that most of us are going to catch it. But what this model tells you, and I should stress, this is possibly one of the most basic disease models you can do. But the power in mathematical models is that they not only tell you things that may seem obvious, but they also tell you how to alter things and control things and get them back under control and back in your favor. What we can see here from our simple model is the importance of this contact ratio, Q. It appears in the answers to all three of our key questions. So whilst we can't stop the spread anymore, that's already happened, but what we can do is look at questions two and three, because we can see that if we want to reduce the number of people that have the disease at a given time, I max, then what we need to do is we need to make the value of F as large as possible. And we saw earlier on our graph that this happened when Q was small. And similarly for question three, the total number of people catching the disease, we want to make G of Q, we want to make that as large as possible so that the total number of people gets much smaller. And again, that happened for a smaller value of Q. So what can we do to reduce the value of Q? Q, remember, is the contact ratio. This is the fraction of the population that comes into contact with an infective individual during their period of infectiousness. So this is exactly why currently we are told to wash our hands. If you wash your hands, even if you have been in contact with somebody with the disease, you are much less likely to then catch it yourself. Social distancing. This is why we have new measures telling us to keep away from people. Because if you stay away from other people, you are reducing your probability of coming into contact with somebody that has the disease, and you're therefore reducing this value Q. So we need to do everything we can to reduce the value Q, and all of the current measures are telling us to do exactly that. So if you weren't convinced already, I hope that you are now. Let's keep washing our hands, let's keep practicing social distancing, and ultimately let's try and lower the value of the contact ratio Q. Because as we've seen here in the SIR model, the lower the value of Q, the fewer people that catch the disease. Thank you everyone for watching. Please do subscribe to my channel if you've enjoyed this video, and I will be back soon. And remember, keep rocking maths.